Hey, beautiful humans. Today, I'm going to be talking about how to release worry from your body. I'm Suki Baxter, founder of Whole Body Revolution, and I help you to rewire yourself for greater health, happiness, and success. Most of the time when we're worried, we're sent to somebody who helps us to get our thoughts in order, like a therapist or a counselor. Worry is generally seen as a mental disorder or a disorder of thinking wrongly or a pessimistic outlook. And so the thinking goes, if you just change the way you're thinking, that your worry will go away and everything will be better. But anyone who's tried to change their worried thoughts knows that they just creep back in moments or even seconds later. It can be really hard to not be worried. As soon as you put down one worried thought, another one creeps up into your mind. And it seems like if you're not worried, it's really hard to be anything else if that's the habit. So what's going on here? Well, the reality is you can't be worried without having a physical corresponding reaction. So every thought, feeling, or emotion that you have is reflected in your body. It's reflected in your muscles. And the reality is your, your brain doesn't just exist here in your head. It exists everywhere throughout your body. All of your neural matter condenses down and it becomes these little threads that innervate all of your organs and muscles and bones and Everything in your body is connected to your brain. So when you have an experience, an emotional experience like worry, it's happening on the physical level as well as on the mental and emotional and energetic levels as well. So it's very difficult to have a worried thought without contracting your shoulders. This tends to happen. This tends to be the posture of worry, like, oh, what's gonna happen? Um, it's a very defensive, guarding, protective posture. What happens over time though is when worry becomes a habit, so does the contraction of your shoulders and muscles. And so what we tend to think of as something that happens with aging, which is tightness and stiffness and soreness, is really the habituation of an emotional state, the habituation of a worried or anxious or panicked state. And when your body is tense and tightening and guarding and defensing, it's actually telling your brain, we're not safe. So when you try to put down the worried thoughts just from the mental level and just be like, I'm not going to worry about that, but you don't address what's happening at the physical level, the contraction that's ongoing completely beneath your conscious awareness, unless you have soreness on a regular basis, but the actual tightening of the muscles you're not doing consciously. And if you don't address that, then your body is constantly signaling to your brain, we are worried there's something to be worried about. It's not safe here. In addition to tight shoulders, people who worry chronically often have tension in their arms and hands, abdominals, hip flexors. It's a body-wide problem. So if you are somebody who tends to have contraction through the front of your body, almost like you're trying to curl into the fetal position, that posture can tend to make your brain think there's something to worry about. And you know that stress is bad for you, that it can cause all kinds of diseases and illnesses and shorten your lifespan. Well, worry is no different. And actually what happens is that this muscular tension that comes you know, alongside worry, that comes part and parcel of worry, these are called isometric contractions. Your brain on a subconscious level, so you're not consciously doing this, but some part of your brain is signaling to your muscles to contract at 30%, 50%, 70%, some percentage of their contractile ability. And just to hold that tension there, so it's a tight muscle, a muscle knot, you might say. What tends to happen with those isometric contractions is that your sympathetic, your fight or flight branch of your nervous system takes over and reduces what's called heart rate variability. So normally your heart rate should actually fluctuate quite a bit and what that changes your blood pressure. There's sort of an ebb and a flow of the pressure of blood flowing through your arteries. But with these isometric contractions ongoing, the smooth muscle walls of the, the vascular walls tend to contract, which means that they get very fixed. So they no longer are supple and adaptable to changes in blood flow. And so there is some conjecture that this worried posture is correlated to cardiovascular disease and heart attacks. But what do we do about it? So I do think that cognitive strategies can be helpful. So therapy definitely has a time and a place. However, most therapy, unless it's somatically aimed therapy that really engages the body, does not address the physical aspects of worry and stress. It does not 
address sort of the subterranean uh, neuromuscular patterns that are going on beneath your conscious awareness. It's very good at making you aware of your thought patterns. It's very good at making you aware of your behavior patterns and making sense of all of that. And I definitely think it's useful. However, we do need to remove that worried pattern from your body so that your body can catch up to your brain if you're doing all that other work to kind of get rid of your worry. So the first thing that we need to do is regulate your nervous system. Basically, when you're in a chronic worried state, like I said, you are in fight or flight and your sympathetic nervous system is taking over. You're locked into sympathetic overdrive where you can't rest and relax. So probably even when you are, quote, relaxing, you're not fully relaxed. And we know that because when we have, not me personally, but when researchers have measured muscle tension in people, the residual muscle tension that comes from uh, that worried state that's existing beneath your conscious awareness, that never goes away. That stays present whether you're chilling on the couch or even when you're sleeping. So when you're stuck in this sympathetic overdrive, you can't sh shift into, like downshift into relax and restore mode, which means your body also can't heal, your brain can't restore itself, and over time, these patterns can result in burnout. And the problem with a burnout state is that uh, when they do functional MRIs and look at the brains of burned out people, they actually mirror the brains of uh, people who have suffered severe childhood trauma. So burnout is a trauma state. So first and foremost, we've got to get you regulated. And one of my favorite tools for helping the nervous system to get regulated is orienting. So just bringing yourself into the present moment. Because your body is stuck in this habit of defense and protect, uh, it's important to let your body know, like let your deeper levels of your nervous system know that it is safe. And so orienting is simply a practice of becoming aware of the space that you're in right now. And as long as you're not driving, you can try it right now. Just sitting in your chair, you can start to let your eyes drift around the room. And what I've noticed with people when doing this practice is that people who are in sympathetic overdrive in chronic worry states or have trauma in their systems of any sort, they tend to have very quick, rapid, darting eye movements. Their eyes never land on anything. So really pay attention to letting your eyes softly drift around the room, nice and slow. You can let your gaze get very fuzzy and you don't need to worry about changing your breath at all, but just put some awareness on it and notice that as you're doing this exercise, there might be some changes on its own. It may just shift. You may have some deep breaths that happen. You may have some sighs or something may shift there, but you don't need to actually try to change it. And as you're doing this, just take note of colors, textures, shapes, any kind of object, anything interesting in your environment that draws your visual attention. And you don't need to write it down or call it out or tell anyone. You don't really even need to name it. You don't need to describe it. You don't even have to have words for it. But just if something feels like it's attracting your vision, let your eyes land there for a little while. Just let them explore that, the textures, the colors, whatever it is, it might be close or it might be far away. And that's something else to play with. If you're in a small room and particularly if you live in a city, explore letting your gaze drift out the window to things that are further away and then come inside and land on things that are closer to you. And notice which feels more relaxing or if there's a difference at all. Your gaze actually needs about 20 feet of difference in order to be able to relax. And so a lot of us who are in front of screens or who are in cities where the spaces tend to be smaller, we're not in wide open territory where we can kind of really look across very far distances, we don't get that stimulation very often. So it can be really helpful to intentionally let your gaze drift out of a window and look to far away mountains or trees or whatever's in the distance. And as you're doing this, notice if your breath has changed, notice if you're starting to get some sighs and some relaxation, 
start to notice as well the feeling of your feet on the floor. So keeping your gaze moving around or landing on whatever feels attractive, pay attention to the sense of your feet on the floor and how that feels. Again, you don't need to have words. It doesn't need to be good or bad. You don't need to change anything about your feet on the floor unless it feels more comfortable to you. But just pay attention to what's going on there. And when you feel ready, you can bring your attention back to yourself and back to this video. And just notice if your shoulders have relaxed a little, if your breathing is a little bit deeper in your chest, maybe it's coming down into your stomach and your diaphragm a little bit more, your deep rib cage. And notice if you just feel more calm and more present. And this is, this is a simple orienting task that you can do anytime. There are lots of ways to orient. This is only one, um, but it's one that I like because it's accessible to everyone at any time, obviously not if you're driving, uh, but any other time, pretty much, you can definitely use this practice. So orienting makes use of one type of sensory awareness. It starts to connect you back to what's happening in the now, in the here and the now. When you're in a chronic worried state, essentially some part of you is living probably in the past and maybe possibly in the future. It might be stuck in a traumatic incident that you experienced, or you could have just learned this worried state from a caregiver. Our nervous system's entrained to those around us. So if your caregivers, if your parents or whoever it was who raised you had a dysregulated nervous system because of their own upbringing or their own traumatic life experiences, then dysregulated becomes normal. And that's what starts to feel like it's right. I have worked with people and I myself am prone to worry and I've worked with other people who are prone to worry where when the worry goes away, there's almost more worry because there's no worry because that normal state is worry. So orienting brings you back to what's happening right now it starts to regulate that nervous system it starts to dissolve that sympathetic lockdown so that you can be in a more present engaged state if you found this video helpful make sure you check out the videos linked on the screen for more great tips on how to rewire yourself for greater health happiness and success and don't forget to subscribe so you never miss a video update i'll see you in the next one